Okay, hello. Um, I'm Wookie. I'm here to represent the ARM port today, although I see a worrying number of people down here who know at least as much about this as I do, so uh, I expect contradiction later. Um, yes, we have uh, a new port, um, a new ABI. I'm here to explain a bit about how it works and um, what that means for Debian. We'll start off with a little bit of history, just so you know um, how we got to where we are. Uh, some gory details about uh, ARM issues and EABI, uh, so and why this matters, um, why that actually makes a difference to what we're doing, what Debian is going to do uh, as a result of these changes, and where we're at at the moment. So first, just to be clear, um, we're talking about the ABI here, that's the application binary interface, so that's bytes in memory and on the stack and how they're passed between things uh, not the API, uh, the actual which parameters you pass to things. Uh, so uh, fundamentally this is the C calling convention, um, how things are arranged on the stack between functions. And the important thing about that is that everything on the system has to be using the same mechanism. You can't mix stuff using one ABI and the other ABI. Well, I mean, you can technically, but um, life gets uh, horribly broken almost immediately and you don't want to do that. Um, so we have to make a switch. You've got to use one or the other. Uh, whilst we're doing this, because it involves massive breakage, um, it seemed a good time to change the kernel syscall convention because there's efficiency reasons for doing that I'll cover later. Uh, that's not part of the ABI. It's basically entirely separate. We're just doing both at once to uh, have all the breakage in, in one go. So a bit of history. The, uh, the wider Linux ARM kernel port was started in 1998 on a Acorn A5000 um, with an ARM3 in it. That essentially used GCC's existing calling convention uh, for ARM at the time. Uh, so this is about why things are the way they are. It's basically history, what was convenient at the time. The kernel syscall interface uh, was designed uh, to be efficient basically by passing um, most of the parameters in registers, because a lot of calls have less than five parameters. Um, that was more or less used the existing RISCOS convention, because that was what desktop ARM was using at the time, which I think actually comes from the APCS ARM procedure call standard of a uh, very long time ago indeed. The change was uh, RISCOS uses a couple of spare bits at the beginning in the address to return errors, and we don't do that in mm -hmm. Linux. The other thing was floating points, uh, simple enough. Uh, if you had floating point instructions, you use the floating point coprocessor to process them, just like on x86. Um, if you haven't got a floating point unit present, and it isn't always, um, you emulate it. So the Debian port uh, was started uh, a couple of years later, about 2000, primarily because of the Rebel Netwinder device. Uh, it was Netwinder people did a lot of the initial work on making things actually go. Um, a guy called Jim Pick, I think, was one of the main people at Debian to do the work. I noticed his uh, LinkedIn profile says he worked on Debian and nothing else for two and a half years around about then. That would explain a lot. Um, so we've supported various machines over the years um, in the installer, and quite a lot are used without explicit installer support, uh, or even necessarily mainline kernel support. Um, people use the Debian ARM pile uh, on their weird and wonderful devices all over the place. So, some actual issues about EABI itself. Uh, floating point is uh, one of the most obvious. The, as I said, the floating point thing was fairly reasonable. Use the floating point unit for the floating point instructions. The only problem was that, in fact, there have only ever been two CPUs in the world with a, an, a, a real ARM floating point unit in. The original ARM FPA thing, which demonstrated the principle, never really worked quite right and the ARM 7500FE device, which was quite popular in its day, circa 1996. Um, and since then, there have been thousands and thousands of devices, uh, well, hundreds of different designs, uh, none of which had FPUs in them. Uh, in fact, some recent devices have had FPUs, but they're not ARM FPUs with the same instruction set. They're different. So, for example, Cirrus produce um, a thing called Maverick Crunch, which is basically just about enough floating point unit to process MP3 efficiently. 
Um, and Intel have their MMX alike for ARM. Oh, I'm not quite sure what people use that for. Nothing, as far as I know. And more recently, ARM themselves have specified a new floating point scheme called Vector Floating Point, VFP, which is in recent chips. So ARM 11 primarily, um, but I think that Philips chip uh, is an ARM 9 with VFP in it, apparently. So something like 99.7% of all the CPUs, ARM CPUs ever sold, do not have floating point. Um, so effectively, you've never got it. So you have to emulate uh, or otherwise deal with the issue because people persist in using floating point in their software. I don't know why. There's, the original way of doing it was uh, an emulator. The obvious thing to do, the CPU will give you a data abort when, an instruction abort when you hit an instruction it doesn't know what to do with. The kernel can trap that. It will then set up the registers and then run some code which emulates the instruction and then hand back the results as if it had come from a real FPU. The problem with that is that there's hundreds and hundreds of instructions for every floating point instruction you wanted to do just in setup and arrangement. It's grossly inefficient, uh, so it's really, really slow. The original software to do that was a binary module from Acorn, the FPE, which was exclusively licensed to Russell King as part of the kernel port, so we could at least do it. But obviously that's not very useful in free software world. So the Netwinder people wrote a free software implementation, NWFPE, and later FastFPE, which is the same thing, but doesn't worry about the last few significant digits in exchange for a significant improvement in speed. So a better way of doing this is to not bother with the instruction trapping and the setup and all that, because you know perfectly well you haven't got an FPU before you start, so you compile in a set of instructions which will emulate the thing into the original binary. Uh, that's much more efficient. GCC provided this functionality. It's called SoftFloat. The problem is that uh, these two calling mechanisms are not the same, uh, so they're incompatible. You can't just compile a little bit of code with soft float because you cared about floating point performance and leave the rest as it was. You've got to do it all that way or all the other way. Uh, and of course, the Debian ARM port, because it's old, uh, used the convention at the time, which was the uh, hard float emulation. Uh, soft float came along later, so we can't use soft float, essentially. Uh, the other thing about floating point on ARM is that it has a peculiar format. Um, the endianness of a double, so the floating point representation, is, is the endianness of the CPU within the bytes, um, but it's always big endian for the two words. So on a big endian ARM, that's OK. It's both of those are big endian, so you have normal big endian representation. On a little endian ARM, the words are big endian, but the bytes are little endian. Um, nobody else does this. <laughs> Um, the format is IEE754 compliant, apparently, um, but in practice, um, everybody's software goes, you do what? This means that anything which manipulates doubles itself goes wrong. Um, so that means glibc. Fortunately, nearly everything uses glibc, so once you fix that, a lot of software works. But there's a fair amount of stuff which doesn't. Uh, Perl, Mozilla, of course, numeric. Uh, various mass libraries, Java, some other languages, uh, all go and do their own floating point manipulations and have to be uh, hacked about to support this strange format. Now, of course, over the last nine years, we have fixed most of that software, but now we're going to have to unfix it again to say, ah, well, if it's an ARM, uh, only do this if you're doing things old style. If it's new style, it's just normal. So normal big endian it'll be, uh, or little endian, depending which way around you are, I think. Um, so EABI does away with this. We just get conventional formats like other little or big endian CPUs. So the summary of the significant, there are a whole load of little detailed changes in the ABI which you don't care about and I don't even know about. Uh, these are the important ones. Uh, structure packing was something that used to catch people out on ARM. Um, it was always aligned on four byte boundaries, everything. So even chars, you only got one char every four bytes uh, in a struct. And of course that caught people out because they expect them to be packed four bytes, um, four bytes in a a word, so you'd get four chars in it. Not an arm, you didn't. Um, that broke a lot of software. That changes. EABI now has natural packing. So one byte things pack on byte boundaries, four byte things pack on four byte boundaries, eight byte things pack on eight byte boundaries, which again is a lot more like other architectures, so um, more software will just work. Uh, pretty much the same. So that structure and argument alignment, really, um, a similar issue. Enums 
are a bit odd. In the EABI, actually allows enums to have variable type size. The E in e EABI stands for embedded, strictly speaking. So it was an agreement amongst uh, ARM and uh, lots of ARM CPU licensees like Philips and Cirrus Logic and all these people who make chips uh, using ARM's designs on how stuff should be done so that everybody could agree on one way of doing things. And the more embedded you are, the more you care about shrinking things down. And there was quite some pressure for um, an enum that only had four possibilities to be represented in um, one byte. And you only wanted to use four bytes for an enum if you really did want to represent millions of things. Um, nevertheless, uh, the Linux people decided they weren't going to use that because too much stuff would break, apparently. So uh, GNU Linux is actually a slight deviation from uh, EABI as probably used by other compilers um, and will remain as four bytes per enum. And as I said, the floating point stuff is fixed. Now you can interoperate between, you can choose whether to use VFP or soft float, uh, i.e. hardware floating point, whatever's provided, or Maverick Crunch, whatever, uh, or soft float emulation, depending what you've got, and you can mix and match that code. So uh, why would anyone care about all this stuff? What's wrong with the old ABI? Well, uh, as I said, most of the ARM stuff, which is odd and caused software breakage, uh, some of which still hasn't been fixed in the nine years we've had to try and fix it all, uh, that nearly everything builds for ARM these days, but there's a fair amount of software that doesn't actually work still. If you start looking in numerical libraries, you'll find it's all bust. Um, not that we really care. So a, uh, it, it's just easier. People's software works, and there's less porting to be done. Uh, strange bugs don't appear. Uh, the ability to interwork hard and soft float uh, is important. That can make big differences to how fast things go. People did some tests and found the new ABI was 22 times faster on something with a little bit of floating point in it. Um, so you're still emulating, but you know it's 22 times better. That's worth having. Um, for normal code, I don't. It'll be a tiny bit faster, but not a great deal. We also get some standardisation we didn't have before. Now you can build the same binaries, at least in principle, using ARM's commercial ADS compiler and GCC or even Green Hills tools, whatever, they should all spit out the same binaries. And in the past, they were, it wasn't true. If you used ADS, you got completely different binaries from if you used GCC uh, on the same sources, and that was annoying. Also, commercial debugging tools uh, will now work. So if you're actually um, a professional developer and you want to go faster and people have cool toys to play with, um, you can still use GCC, but use that fancy stuff. Uh, it works with Thumb, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, probably not a huge issue within Debian, but handy nevertheless. And interchangeable binaries is, again, something we free software people don't care about much, but um, it's certainly useful for some people. So the point is that binaries targeting ParmOS, Linux, or Symbian OS should be the same, which means um, people can produce um, nasty evil bits of binary blob code, which they can sell to all of those people uh, and have it work. So it's convenient for binary sellers, but um, doesn't make much difference to us. Uh, the syscall convention is slightly more efficient. I'll cover that in a mo. Just a tiny speed up. Um, the big disadvantage is that all this new stuff is entirely incompatible with what's gone before. And that is, of course, a big deal. So the syscall convention, uh, as I say, this isn't really part of the ABI, but um, people have been wanting to change it for a while, and uh, now is the time if we're ever going to do it. Um, so we're taking a, a random kernel. This is, this is the interface between user space and the kernel. You have to call stuff. There has to be an agreed standard way of doing it, and we don't want to change it very often. The old way yeah, essentially put the um, parameters into registers and then called um, SWI as a software interrupt. And effectively, it just jumped somewhere um, using this table in memory offset by the uh, call number. Um, that was um, one fewer instructions than the way we do it now, which is to explicitly put the call number into register and then jump to the same place. Um, the first one works better on von Neumann architecture, which is when you have a combined data and instruction cache because the table is almost always in the cache. So in fact, you, even though in theory you're reading a data table out of memory, uh, in practice you've already always, almost always already got it, so it's really quick and saves you a, an instruction. Um, but uh, if you've got Harvard architecture, which nearly all ARM CPUs since ages have had, 
uh, which is a separate data and instruction cache. Uh, the old scheme pollutes the data cache um, when all you were wanting to do was execute some instructions, so that's a bit tiresome. So uh, the ABI method is slightly faster. In theory, uh, in practice, of course, at the moment, kernels support both of these core mechanisms, uh, and at the moment, you generally leave that turned on. So uh, if you keep the support for the old mechanism, then it doesn't go any faster, uh, which is where we're at at the moment. So this changed in 2615, 2616, which I think was the beginning of 2006. Um, there had to be a corresponding transition in glibc uh, up to 2.36. It used the old scheme. After 2.4, it used the new scheme. Uh, just a little bit about the history of where this came from. It's obviously been driven by ARM Corporation, ultimately. Um, it, as much as possible, they've used external uh, open specifications, so ELF, the dwarf debugging format, and standard C++ ABI. Uh, some internal documents, like the AA PCS and stuff, and uh, some of the extra bits and bobs. And there's also new instructions which are coming out in forthcoming ARM architectures and instruction sets, which they kind of thought, oh, well, if we're going to do that, while well, we're changing everything, we'll bear that in mind. Um, and a few new bits. So it's a reasonably open specification. I mean, it, it is open. You can read it all, do what you like. Um, some timeline of where, when and where things happened. So Code Sorcery were doing the GCC changes to support all this, which obviously is the first stage. That was finished towards the end of 2005, the first time you actually get a compiler that would spit out, well, a free compiler that would spit out EABI binaries, GCC 3.4.4. Um, in 2005, a few people, so Nokia in the N770 and Montevista started using that, um, but still with the old kernel syscall mechanism, so that's kind of half new ABI, or three quarters, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then this kernel syscalls changed a bit later. Uh, and Debian started deciding we ought to do something about this uh, in 2006. Uh, I worked on tool chains, and so, called, so did Cold Sorcery. Um, so we had a working GCC4 tool chain in the beginning of 2006. Um, but it's still difficult uh, to port Debian because of the problem that you need a working system to build all your stuff on because everything's natively built. Um, and cross-building everything's a pain in the bum. So life got a lot easier once the OE people had got, managed to cross-build a whole working OE setup. Um, so now you had a file system enough like what you wanted to end up with that you could actually build all the stuff you wanted to end up with on. Um, so uh, Lennart did a, a sterling job in actually getting all that working in beginning of this year. Uh, that's targeting V4T. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, but then it's not a DD, so those are unofficial packages. So since then, uh, Riku over there has set up a couple of build Ds with ORL. And uh, they've been building away for about a month and a half now. And uh, that's, that's going quite well. So we pretty much have a functioning port. I'll come on to the actual status towards the end. Uh, just a little review of what you need for this to work. 3.4.4 uh, was the first thing that would do this, but the mechanism changed between GCC 3 and GCC 4. Uh, it was just an option saying build it like this. It later became a different GNU architecture. So it used to be Linux ARM GNU, now it's Linux ARM GNU ABI. Uh, uh, glibc, you need the right version. As I said, 2.4 was the first one to support this properly, but in fact, it didn't work very well on ARM. So in practice, you need glibc 2.5 to uh, have stuff that all works, and kernel support, cross tool, blah, blah, blah. CPU versions. So now we get on to uh, Debian and what we're going to do about all this. Um, one thing you need to understand is what these version numbers mean. So as well as all the ARM 7 and ARM 9 and ARM 11, which are core design version numbers. We also have instruction set numbers, which basically use the same numbers in a jolly confusing fashion, unless you follow this in loving detail. Uh, so the version 3 instruction set was what was used in the ARM3 uh, RISC PCs um, quite a long time ago. Uh, the version 4 instruction set was uh, DEX, strong ARM, which was later taken over by Intel. 
V4T means the version 4 instruction set with thumb instructions. Um, and then there's version 5, which is what most CPUs available now are using. And there's version 6, which is just starting to come out. And we'll have funky new stuff, I'm assured. Um, the issue here is that uh, thumb interworking is the thing that allows you to switch between thumb and normal instructions. And that uses instructions that don't exist on all these instruction sets, or do slightly different things. Uh, so there's issues of which of these instruction sets you can support, and therefore which processors. And Debian does its best to support everything uh, that's reasonable, and we have to decide where to uh, go on this list. So the, the official ABI spec only goes down to V4T. It doesn't support V4. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute. So Thumb, for those who don't know, is a 16-bit opcode set instead of the 32-bit uh, set normally used. The advantage is that basically you can fit exactly the same code into 30% less space. If you're a mobile phone manufacturer, that's great. Uh, and you can use a 16-bit wide ROM instead of a 32-bit wide one and save money. Um, and then wires and routing space, oh, it's just great. <laughs> the rest of us think, 16 bits, 32 bits, who cares? Um, so there is nothing in Debian that uses thumb right now, um, partly because you couldn't under the old scheme in a sensible way. Uh, I don't know whether we ever want to produce anything using thumb, but who knows? Uh, but EABI explicitly allows uh, every function to be one or the other. So you can swap from thumb to normal and back um, every function, should you so wish. And to do that, the CPU needs to be synchronized. You need an atomic instruction that makes sure you know the CPU state. Um, uh, on V4T, the BX instruction is used to do that. On V5, it's the LDR, LDM. Um, unfortunately, V4 chips don't have the BX instruction. It's not there. So uh, if you build EABI stuff, every function call will contain a BX instruction, which means that uh, every function call will abort uh, on a V4 CPU. Now, the problem with that is that strongarm is V4, and all our buildies are strong arms at the moment, pretty much, uh, and there's still quite a lot of those in use. Um, you can work around that by just checking whether thumb is supported. That's what testlr hash one does. Uh, and if it isn't, um, just skip the BX instruction. Uh, it'll still work. There is a GCC patch to do that. Uh, recently, but it's not properly tested, uh, um, and we haven't really proved that it all works to our satisfaction. So right now, everything's being built for V4T. Um, so a Debian port. Um, we could just stick with the existing ABI. It's not broken. It's just a bit slow. It supports everything. Um, however, uh, I think the whole world is moving to the ABI, well, ARM world, and we are probably going to be forced to follow um, we've done the work now. So there's that. We get significant advantages in terms of things going faster and being able to use floating point where it exists, and it is starting to exist in new CPUs. And also a whole load of software that in fact has never worked properly will start working uh, because of all the weird shit we don't do anymore. Um, as I also mentioned, we get binary compatibility, which allows the use of commercial tools, which is useful to some people. Um, however, uh, there is this problem that we have to change. How are we going to manage that? So there's various ways we could have done this. Um, you could just rename all the library packages. That's the classic transition mechanism within Debian. Whenever C++ people change their conventions again, we have to <laughs> go through a lot of pain. The problem with that is that every single library package has to be renamed uh, so that you can control the point at which you finally change over. Uh, which takes ages to manage. Uh, it was six months for the last C++ transition. If we had to do it for effectively everything that uses C, um, that might be a couple of years worth. Um, so that means every library package in the whole of Debian would have to be broken for a couple of years just to support the ARM people wanting to change their ABI, which I don't think would go down very well. Um, so <laughs> that wasn't going to fly. We could define a new architecture. Now, normally architectures are fundamentally different things, PowerPC, ARM, x86. Um, you know, so ARM and new ABI ARM aren't really incompatible things. You know, it should be the same architecture. Um, but the problem is GCC doesn't treat it that way. GCC claims it's a new architecture. All your GNU triplets, all your auto make, all that stuff 
um, says it's different. So um, there's a lot to be said for following that lead and treating it as a new arch. Uh, the advantage is that it doesn't affect anybody else. We can do our transition quietly on our own, um, and you can just have them both side by side, which is especially an issue if we're not going to be able to support the old CPUs with the new ABI. Um, disadvantages is that if you've got an old ABR machine, you can't upgrade it to a new one. You know, you're changing architectures, that's a reinstall, or um, I'll say a deb takeover magic, which might work. Um, and of course, we use all the archive space uh, in Debian for having everything twice. Uh, arguably, a better solution would be an ABI field, uh, which uh, specified the ABI and would, this deals with the general problem of ABI transitions, not just ours. Um, C++'s or Pung, libpungs or whoever's, um, which uh, has been in the multi-arch proposal for a while. Unfortunately, it's not part of Debian yet, so we couldn't use it because it's not done. It would have been nice to try. Um, uh, finally, you could have just said, well, we'll just make a conflicting libc, new style libc, which can fix with the old libc, and then everything will depend on the new one, um, and you just have to install the new one and install everything else all in one go. Uh, the problem with that is it doesn't actually work. <laughs> uh, and um, most of the port would have been uninstallable for you know, probably, I don't know, months while it, uh, we rebuilt everything so that you could actually press the button to change. Um, and that wouldn't have given us a mechanism to support the older CPUs either. So uh, as you can tell from the bias in that discussion, uh, we decided to go for a new architecture um, it's a bit of a problem with the name. Obviously, the best name is ARM. Unfortunately, we've already used that, so we had to pick a new one. And uh, ARM EL, basically little endian ARM, uh, was uh, picked. Uh, slightly confusing because there was already an ARM EB which used the old ABI, uh, and there still is. Um, they could just change and have two called ARM EB, which is um, actually using now using the new ABI. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen there. There's, the reason why ARMYB came into being was really because there was a binary uh, Ethernet driver for the slug, and the only way the only way to make it work was to rebuild the whole of everything uh, the other way around. Uh, uh, fortunately, that was reverse engineered, so the problem went away. Uh, so most ARM CPUs can run either Big Endian or Little Endian. Uh, they're more for conventional reasons, and because early CPUs only ran Little Endian, um, there aren't huge important reasons to run Big Endian. It's only really network processor people who spend so much of their life swapping Ethernet packets around that it's worth rebuilding the whole of the system the other way around to improve your Ethernet packet shifting functionality. So where we're at now, um, as I said, the Riku's build these have been chuntering away for um, a month and a half or so, and we now have 74% built, um, which is pretty good. It's just starting to asymptote, I think. We're getting to the stage where it isn't that things aren't built yet, it's that stuff doesn't work. <laughs> so we'll actually have to start fixing things again. Um, two Thekus buildies, that's all attached to the unofficial buildee network of Andreas Managers, I think. It's a fine resource. Um, the aim is to have Army L, does that say? 15. 15. Uh, in Lenny, which means uh, qualification uh, the usual release qualification requirements. We've got to get 95% of it working, uh, or at least built, <laughs> um, and so on and so on. Uh, I don't think that's going to be an issue. We've got a year or something. Uh, that should be no problem. Uh, there is work to do, but uh, I believe it will be done. Uh, there is this question of uh, whether we're going to support StrongArm or not. Uh, and that the main issue there is if ARMEL doesn't support StrongArm, and we think StrongArm, there's still enough StrongArms to matter, then the old ARM port will have to stay around and we'll have to have two um, for as long as anyone cares about strong ARM. And that could be a while, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, or we can um, fix, we can nobble uh, the new compilers to support v4. So the, the thing I didn't make clear perhaps earlier was that if we put that extra test in to not run bx when you're on the wrong sort of CPU, that happens for everything. So every function call has two extra instructions. So um, we lose some efficiency there. Now, I'm not sure how much difference that makes in the real world. It might be 2% slower or something. I think we can live with that for 
supporting the whole world. And you know, in, in four years' time, we could drop it because nobody cares about Strongham anymore. Um, so that is the probably the major remaining issue, I think. Uh, oh, no, the other one is, of course, what are we going to do about all the poor people who've got to transition their existing ARM machines to new ARM? And, uh, most of them will say, but it's not broken. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we're quite likely to take their port away within a few years, so something will have to happen. Uh, I think research is needed on whether we can reasonably, reliably automate that process so people have got a fighting chance of changing everything at once without it all going horribly wrong. Um, I think, I understand Deb Takeover is not really supported anymore. I don't know if anyone knows any more about it, but uh, in principle that allows this to happen um, by much magic, and we could try using that. Uh, that's it. That's the end. Um, questions? Are there... Okay. Uh, are there any reasons other than strong ARM support why you would want to keep the ARM, uh, the ARM architecture around uh, consecutively with ARM EL? Um, apart from giving people a decent period to change over, which is obviously affected by how much pain and aggravation that is, I don't think so. I mean, I have seen a certain amount of, oh, uh, what's wrong with the old port kind of thing. But to be honest, no, this is supposed to be a, a complete replacement. So, Joey has something to say. Um, just to follow up on that, we could, for example, decide that we want to um, do the transition from ARM to ARM EL by upgrading the old system to the new version and then just replacing every binary with the ARM EL version, which means that you have to upgrade all the packages first to Lenny and then all the, all the ARM packages upgrade to Lenny and then you, know you can trans, then you know you can swap in the ARM EL builds or something like that. It might be helpful to have all the Lenny stuff. You know, we don't know yet. So I didn't understand that. What was that again, Jimmy? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm yeah, yeah. Upgrade the existing ARM system to the new Debian release to Lenny. And okay. Right. And then you say, okay, I'm going to run some program which just pulls down all the ARM EL DEBs, all the equivalent right. DEBs, and then unpacks them. Wham, okay. you have an ARM EL system. Mm -hmm. Right, so, that's, so. so you mean do a Lenny upgrade and then do a DEB takeover type thing, however we manage that, right. Which would mean we'd only have to keep the two in parallel for one release. Okay, I would just say that keeping them in parallel for one release even seems like a bit much to me. Um, uh, and that scares me. Uh, <laughs> Um, yes, I understand how that could be uh, an option, but I think uh, I think it's going to be a hard sell to the FTP masters. From from my point of view, I think. <laughs> okay, can you? To keep we, we should probably talk about it some more. I mean, there's an arm boff. Uh, I just looked it up. Eleven o'clock in the morning, squeak, uh, in two days' time, and I think we want to sit around and discuss exactly this issue. How are we going to do this? Who? What? You know. The, uh, my question, I think, would be what are the alternatives to um, keeping them in parallel for one? I can't see another way of doing it from where we're at now. But, um, you know, if, if there's another way of doing it and we have time, then fine. Right. I'm just not convinced that, they're, that keeping them in parallel, unless you're doing something evil like Joey always plans to do, then I don't see there's actually any advantage to keeping them in parallel other than you, you're saying that you're not going to support Strongarm on ARMEL, and Strongarm still has a user base that you want to continue providing. Yes, that, that's currently for. Right at where we're at now. That's the main reason. Okay. Um, another question about the thumb architectures and the extra instructions. What happens with inline it, w with this particular patch, or has anybody even looked at what happens if you try to do an inline function with the thumb? I don't know. Somebody here must. I assume the compiler takes care of it, but. <laughs> Maybe it has to be a real function call, and an inline function call can't be the wrong instruction set. Simon, no? Um, uh, yeah, the compiler sorts this out. So uh, it's just a function prolog and epilog, and if we are inlining, we're, we can leave these out. So it's not a problem. Okay. 
uh, if we are inlining, we can leave out the function prologue and epilogue, of course. And since it only affects the epilogue. If you're inlining something that uses a different size opcode than the function calling it, how can you leave it out? Um, we, we cannot inline uh, uh, things uh, with another calling convention. The, the calling convention. Or, or, or rather, uh, the, uh, we, we, the compiler cannot generate code that switches in between the function at the moment. Okay, I think so. I think the answer is you can't do that. I believe the issue is on the return from the function call, which doesn't apply in an inline function case. There is no return because you've inlined it. So you don't need the kludge. Right, but that's not a um, v4 stroke v4t issue. That's a generic issue which doesn't apply because the compiler doesn't do that. I understand what you're asking, Steve, but I don't know the answer. Um, ask the GCC people, they'll know. Uh, thumb interworking means that when you're returning from a function, you can either fall into the thumb or into arm code. So you have to be in a sane state at that point. If you're inlining, you can check it back to the arm state, and it's not a problem after that. Anything else? Preferably easier questions than that. Um, I wonder if you could show us the build D graph. I, it might just be that I'm partially colorblind, but I wouldn't be able to figure out which line was arm EL, and I didn't see one that was rising that we've described. So. <laughs> Somewhere, maybe even. Want it. I appear to have lost the bookmark. So only if someone can tell me where it is. So the rising light blue line is us. So we've just about caught up the it is basically BSD AMD sixty four port. Um, Sorry, I'm doing the microphone. Mm -hmm. uh, and round about then we'll probably have to start doing some work on the things that don't build. Fortunately, there will be things which just fix themselves, like mono basically doesn't work on old ARM. Did for a bit once, but never really has properly, but it does work with new EABI. So that's one of the reasons we may be forced to change is that the rest of the world's fixing stuff for new ABI now um, and kind of going, oh, we don't care if the old ones bust tough. So yes. Everyone should applaud Riku for actually making this happen rather than the rest of us kind of go, oh yeah, I must do that. <laughs> I think we're done. Anything else? Okay, thank you.